First of all, I wanted to thank Dr. Pomplikow and the ORI Project for organizing this symposium and uh, putting forth the invitation to me. I am really honored to be here with you guys. I want to introduce myself a little bit further. Um, my name is Kristen Woods. I'm with Alabama Extension and Auburn University. I have a background in extension going back about 17 years, uh, starting out mainly in food safety, doing HACCP training, serve safe training, better process control school, all sorts of things. Uh, about 10 years ago, I began to, to get more focused on farming food safety. Uh, so doing good agricultural practices to help growers meet buyer requirements. And then most recently with the passage of the Food Safety Modernization Act, I became focused on uh, helping growers meet those regulatory requirements. For the last four years, I've been on the staff of the Produce Safety Alliance as their Southeastern Regional Extension Associate. And I have actually just returned to Alabama full time uh, to uh, to help our, our growers there uh, meet these regulatory requirements and other, some of the other challenges that they face. I also have a small farm in Southwest Alabama and I have goats and chickens. And in the past I have grown produce for direct and retail markets. And um, my farm is part of the NRCS Conservation Stewardship Program and things like soil health and uh, wildlife habitat, the things that we're talking about here today, are deeply important to me um, on my own farm. Uh, so today, today we're going to talk a little bit about water and wildlife and how those two things intersect on a, for produce growers in particular on fruit and vegetable farms. And then we're going to finish up with uh, talking about some of the emerging research in those areas. So I wanted to talk very briefly about the general food safety risks associated with fruits and vegetables. Of course, fruits and vegetables are eaten without cooking. Um, you might even notice uh, folks in the grocery store will eat grapes and sometimes berries and strawberries um, right there in the grocery store. They're not even rinsed off many times. Uh, low numbers of pathogens can be infectious. We're talking for some pathogens, it could be one, two, or three. Um, transient contamination makes it very hard for a grower to uh, monitor and prevent that contamination. So think about a bird or a flock of birds that is here to get today and gone tomorrow, and the farmer might not even know that they've been there. Uh, once attached, uh, pathogens can't be washed off via, via normal means. Um, think about the leaf of a lettuce in particular. The lettuce has holes in it, the stromata that uh, allow it to respire, to breathe. And uh, if bacteria gets internalized into that lettuce leaf, of course, it's, it's pretty impossible to get it off. Um, but you can also see how that applies to the surface of a blueberry. Uh, once a, a bacteria is attached to that blueberry, you would have to scrub it off, thus destroying the blueberry. And lastly, I wanted to mention that we have an increasing number of immunocompromised individuals out in our communities, and our food has to be extra safe for those individuals. In the backdrop to all of this, we have quite a number of regulations in place for our growers to navigate. We have uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act that was passed in 2011. We have produce inspections that began this past summer, and we're going to continue to see inspections for that piece of legislation um, into this summer for smaller farms. We have a number of buyer-driven uh, produce safety requirements, including the LGMA water quality standards, which are getting a lot of press recently. We have a NRCS Conservation Stewardship Program and other NRCS programs that have been around for 80 years, establishing practices to improve conservation on private lands. We have the National Organic Program that was passed in 1990 and, and published in, in 2000 that serves as a guideline for um, growers and other farmers to implement uh, conservation friendly practices and it allows them to partake in a, a marketing program to receive a premium for those products. And then we have the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Um, many people, most people know that it prevents the destruction of endangered species and their habitat. A lot of people don't know that it also requires that other feather, federal agencies ensure that legislation that they enact is not likely to jeopardize endangered species or result in the destruction of habitat. 
Then lastly, we have the EPA, which regulates the use of pesticides, including antimicrobials that are used in the treatment of irrigation and sanit sanitation of equipment. This slide shows an aerial view of the Hema, Arizona growing region that was involved in the spring 2018 E. coli 0157H7 outbreak. So what you're looking at there with the brown areas is a feedlot. So that is either cattle or that is manure. And the green area, of course, is the, the growing area around there. Uh, so this outbreak killed five people and 210 people were, were ill. And um, all of the, the products that were implicated were 100% conventionally grown. The FDA took hundreds and hundreds of samples uh, to try to figure out where the contamination was coming from. And you'll see there were three positive samples depicted by the red circles on the map. And they are surrounding the feedlot there uh, and on, in the, the canal water that is actually running through the feedlot. Um, those samples were actually positive for the outbreak strain of E. coli. They did find other pathogenic uh, microorganisms around the feedlot. Uh, however, they did not match the outbreak strain. So concerns about surface water quality could inadvertently increase the use of groundwater, especially out west where uh, water is a pretty scarce resource, or it could encourage the chemical treatment of irrigation water. Some other options might be uh, testing to determine and address the source of contamination for surface water, or the use of something like UV lights, which would reduce the pathogen load in water that is used for overhead irrigation without having a soil ecology uh, implications there. Uh, and then uh, adjusting irrigation types to something like drip irrigation can also mitigate those risks. Uh, also conserve water in general, although unfortunately something like that would not work for lettuce because many times we're using that overhead irrigation uh, to cool the lettuce in the field as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about contamination from wildlife. Of course there are quite a number of animals, including insects, out in our growing areas. We can't ever eliminate all of the risk, but we can reduce it considerably. So on the, the slide I have depicted areas of lower risk. Of course, we've got our caterpillars and our beneficial insects that are, are out there doing really positive things and are not known to carry pathogens. And then we have more at risk um, animals that are, are known to, to carry pathogens. Um, such as a, a rat in a, an urban farm setting might have proximity to human trash or human sewage even and could carry that into an urban farm. Birds are a bit of a mixed bag and I wanted to highlight an outbreak from 2018 in Alaska uh, where 98 people became ill from Campylobacter. Uh, it, when they investigated this outbreak, uh, they found that the growing area was in proximity to the Palmer Hay Flats National Wildlife Refuge, uh, where there were 20,000 sandhill cranes nesting. And those cranes would come on a daily basis to a pea field. Um, so when they, they looked at the pea field, they found feces everywhere. It was all over the equipment, all over the environment out there. So when we're talking about birds uh, being sources of contamination, we're not talking about that one raptor that's flying overhead. We're really talking about flocks of birds that um, leave an abundance of feces in the area. And we're gonna talk more about birds in just a few minutes. So next I wanted to highlight what I'm gonna call the dung beetle research, but uh, some of you guys might want to call it the Cophophrygus insect research. Um, this was done by Matthew Jones out west and uh, he studied uh, the relationship between dung beetles and, and biodiverse systems and the uh, resulting um, reduction of pathogens in the environment. Uh, so what they found is improved processing of fecal matter when dung beetles in general are present in the environment. They found that organic systems, including dung beetle populations, showed greater fecal processing compared to conventional systems where they introduced beetles. And they found that some dung beetle species are better at reducing E. coli 0157H7 than others, uh, thus highlighting the combined effects of a biodiverse soil microbial population that's supported by organic systems. 
So concern about wildlife as a source of contamination has led to buyer pressure to remove vegetation around crops, uh, removing habitat and food sources for various species, including the all-important bee. Uh, in 2015, Daniel Karp uh, published a paper looking at the effect of surrounding land use on the presence of pathogenic E. coli in lettuce. So what you're looking at there in the graphs on the right, um, the top we're looking at the effect of land use on generic E. coli in water, and the bottom the effect of land use on E. coli in leafy greens. So the orange bar represents cropland surrounding that growing area, the brown is grazing, grazing land surrounding the growing area. The blue bar is riparian zones. And the green is other natural habitat or areas around a growing area. So if we look at the top chart, we actually don't find any significant differences on generic E. coli in water, um, which makes sense because water, surface water is generally flowing uh, through areas and it would change very quickly and we get a lot of variation there. If we look at the bottom chart and we look at grazable land, it, it looks like it resulted in higher levels of enterohemorrhagic E. coli than cropland, riparian, or other natural areas. Uh, what I want to, you to make sure that you notice here is the large amount of variation uh, in the E. coli levels that they found in growing areas that are surrounded by riparian zones and other natural habitat. What that says to me is that it is possible to implement conservation practices like a riparian zone uh, without increasing the amount of pathogens in a growing area. But we, we really don't know all of the factors that are in play there. Um, there's a lot of variation there that, that we have not defined. So I told you we would come back to talking about birds. And I have a bit of a disclaimer. I am an avid birder and bird lover. So I could possibly be a little bit biased when I start talking about birds. Um, I wanted to highlight the work of David Gonthier, who studied the effect of diversity in bird species on, species on 27 strawberry farms in California. So first of all, they wanted to determine the net effect of birds in that environment. So they did some enclosure studies and showed that uh, when there were birds present in that environment, they, uh, there was some bird damage to the strawberries, but that those birds were also eating insects that were damaging the strawberries. So the net effect of the birds was uh, zero, uh, essentially zero in that environment. So then they looked at semi-natural land covering surrounding growing areas, and when they found more of that, they found an increase in bird species diversity, and thus an increase in insectivorous bird species. And you might guess that bird damage to the strawberries went down because the species present were eating more insects. So it's really interesting results that highlights the importance of uh, natural landscapes and re reduction of damage from birds and um, increasing habitat for pollinators as well. Unfortunately, in this particular study, they did not look at a fecal contamination or pathogen contamination. And as I understand it, we can expect some more work out of David Gonthier um, looking at just that. Next, I wanted to highlight the work of Nora Navarro Gonzalez and Michelle J. Russell out of the Western Center for Food Safety at UC Davis. What they did was invite a falconry professional out to leafy green fields to uh, do what they do, uh, which is release a falcon and the falcon chases away all the other birds. Uh, so what they found was that falconry was effective at reducing bird counts in the leafy green fields. And very interestingly, the bird presence remained low for about three days following the falconry intervention. So this is some, an interesting idea uh, a novel idea that could be used with other methods, methods in uh, using a targeted approach uh, close to harvest for uh, reducing bird presence in fields. Okay, so in starting to wrap up, I wanted to talk about what research is needed 
Um, of course, more research is needed around the intersection of conservation and food safety. Um, there's a big question as to whether or not the research that's done out west uh, translates to our environment in the southeast, especially, where we had a lot more rain. It's very humid. We have different water sources in general. We also have different concentrated animal feeding operations and different manure sources. Uh, there's an abundance of poultry in this area, uh, but not so much uh, feedlots. We also have different bird species and different insect species that could be interacting with our food safety concerns and our conservation concerns. Uh, we have different migratory patterns also and a different scale of agriculture. So I want to encourage the farmers in the audience to do uh, is prob is use an adaptive strategy. And this is probably the hardest part of farming for me personally. I would love to have my life planned out for about three years in advance, but every time I go out of town, my plans change in some way. Um, so what an adaptive strategy means that, in using a cover crop as an example, if I plant a lagoon crop, and it, while that crop is growing, I'm gonna monitor a wildlife pressure, and I might, uh, notice that there are 10 times as many deer in that field as there usually are. So I'm going to assess the risk. I'm going to walk out there and see if there are deer feces everywhere. Are there feces from raccoons and other animals and, and birds even out in that field? I'm going to assess the risk and decide that maybe my cash crop should not be lettuce in that field at that time. Maybe it's a better time to plant sweet corn there. And then in the future, I adjust my cover crop rotation, considering this new information, and continue the cycle there. So in summary, of course, I'm an extension, so I'm going to say that training is key. It is incredibly important to being able to assess conservation and food safety concerns both. Um, if you haven't been to a Produce Safety Alliance course, I highly encourage you to do that. What you'll walk out of that training being able to do is assess the risks on your particular farm. Um, I will be very much enjoying the rest of this conference and uh, learning a lot that will help inform my work in the area of, around uh, conservation, sustainable agriculture in the next few days. I uh, want to encourage everyone, researchers and farmers, to focus on reducing risk, not eliminating it. Um, of course, we're talking a lot about how much more research is needed, especially in the South. And uh, make one change at a time. Use an adaptive strategy to improve food safety and conservation, both. So if there's time, I'll now entertain any questions. Uh, thank you all.